The Pact of Umar is a hugely consequential document that had a huge impact on the way in which Jewish life was regulated in Muslim lands. It was not necessarily adhered to according to the letter of the text in every place and in every time. Uh, a lot of variations from the pact, both in terms of leniencies and in terms of stringencies, seems to have uh, been related to the specific uh, inclinations of a particular ruler or a particular time and place. But nevertheless, it does give us a sense of the uh, location that Jews had within the socioeconomic hierarchy of Muslim lands and really contributed quite a bit to their survival under these conditions. The pact is attributed to the second caliph uh, who reigned between the years of 634 and 644. Caliph essentially means successor and this is a reference to the rulers of Muslim lands after Muhammad. Uh, it might also refer to the uh, Caliph known as Umar ibn Abid al-Aziz, who ruled in the 8th century. However, there is a problem with the text because most scholars note that the document is not cited before the early 9th century. So in other words, we're not entirely confident that it was really pertaining to periods prior to the 9th century. But what's especially important for our purposes is, at least from the early 9th century onward, this document both defines and regulates dimma status for Jews. Dimma essentially means protected class, and it refers to the Jews and other so-called peoples of the book that uh, have a place in Muslim society, which is not as high as believers, as Muslims, but nevertheless they have certain protections within that realm as well. Uh, people of the book includes the Christians, and later the Zoroastrians as well, and in certain contexts it refers even to the Hindus, although it doesn't seem to entirely correspond to the same reasons as the monotheistic faiths of Judaism and Christianity in particular. The idea is that their earlier interpretation interaction with the divine is recognized by the Pact of Umar, and as a result, the people who pertain to that faith are uh, therefore guaranteed certain privileges and certain rights, as well as being burdened by some responsibilities. The specific uh, items in the Pact of Umar show the influence of Byzantine regulations and also of Sassanid, that is, Persian regulations as well. What's exactly in the pact? So there are three basic areas uh, that are described in this pact that uh, define what Jews and Christians and Zoroastrians and so on are allowed to do and not allowed to do in Muslim society. And I, I let's look at those three areas. The first is basically they are restricted from engaging in public religious activity, especially activities that might lead to proselytism or disturb the public sensibility that this particular land is Muslim in nature. So examples of this are um, synagogues and churches could not be built anew, they could only be repaired. Now, of course, as I mentioned earlier, quite often this was observed in the breach, and Jews did frequently engage in building new synagogues in Muslim lands, often for an exchange of uh, funds, but nevertheless the idea was that Judaism was to be maintained in its status quo and not expand. Um, very important, I should mention, that uh, the protections that were granted to Jews were uh, offset by a special tax called the jizya, which uh, was frequently quite onerous, but not universally so in Muslim lands. Uh, but to continue, uh, Jews and Christians could not engage in loud public displays of their religious activities, uh, you know, like outdoor parades, or the pact also refers to using noisemakers like clappers during services and so on. This was perhaps more relevant to Christian activity than Jewish activity, but the holiday of Purim, of course, does involve the use of noisemakers. These kinds of things were prohibited by the Pact of Umar, obviously for the purpose of not attracting Muslims to features of the non-Muslim faith. So in other words, Jews could preserve and uh, observe their own religious activity, which is of huge value to the Jews, but they have to kind of like constrain it to make sure that it doesn't impinge on the religious sensibilities of the dominant population. 
Jews were particularly happy about that and very pleased to accept it in the sense that, you know, Jewish practice was protected. Secondly, a range of small symbolic discriminatory practices and social distinctions. For example, Jews were not allowed to bear arms, to carry a sword, uh, to wear certain colors or certain types of clothing that were associated with Muslims. Uh, in fact, they had to wear distinctive clothes that set them apart from Muslims. Again, quite often these practices were simply ignored or bribed out of existence. Uh, Jews could not ride with saddles, they had to use bareback. And whether or not these rules were enforced really depended a lot on local conditions. So the idea though, however, is that while Jews were a protected class, the Dima, nevertheless they were a subjugated class at the same time. But overall, you know, fairly limited restrictions on things like economic activity, you know, so on the whole positive. And third, um, certain preferential support for Muslims, both in terms of financial support, uh, for example, in the jizya, uh, but also in, you know, maintaining Muslim travelers. Jews were required, for example, to extend a certain amount of hospitality to Muslim travelers. Uh, they were prohibited from uh, engaging in certain economic activities like the sale of alcohol, which of course is prohibited in Islam. Uh, and then there were, you know, things like they could not build their houses taller than Muslim houses. The same would apply of their religious uh, structures as well. So this kind of like a uh, uh, put in place uh, another reminder that Muslims were the dominant population and had superior rights and uh, Jews and Christians and so on were a uh, subordinate population. Again, protected, and this is something that Jews really appreciated. It allowed for Islamic lands to uh, achieve the status of being a Rechstadt, a society governed by law, because the Pact of Umar at least defined areas where Jewish activity was protected. The implications are huge because this meant that Jews could rely on certain structures being in place for their maintained activity. It's true that there were at least symbolic placements that kept them in a second class status and theoretically prohibited them from expanding in size, building new synagogues and things like that. But by and large, these things were, were not especially strong um, prohibitions to their advancement. What I think is especially interesting is to contrast the Pact of Umar with the doctrine of witness that we discussed when we looked at the Church Fathers, because this provides us with a kind of point-counterpoint that illustrates the difference of Jews in Muslim lands as opposed to Jews in Christian lands. Uh, Jews in Muslim lands had to recognize their subordinate status, but nevertheless had a tremendous amount of freedom within those boundaries. Uh, in Christian lands, Jews were to be preserved in order to later provide testimony for the truth of Christianity, a theological purpose which posited their future existence, but at the same time kept them in that subordinate status in Christian lands as well. So ironically, the Pact of Umar is kind of like the Muslim version of the Doctrine of Witness that have very similar socio and economic implications. Uh, and we'll have to see in the next few lectures exactly how that played out within Muslim society. In the next lecture, however, we're going to go to the continent of Africa to look at the fascinating and not well studied history of African Jews, and much of this takes place within the Muslim orbit. Thank you very much for watching.